Beloved, his grace is enough for you this morning. It is enough. And it is not based on your or my worthiness to come before his throne, to worship his name, rather by the blood of Jesus Christ. You and I this morning, right, we have been entered into the presence of the Lord through worship, through the blood of the Son. Isn't it amazing, right? Isn't it amazing that we have access to him, that our God is near, amen? Turn with me in your Bibles to Acts chapter 27. We also have the awesome uh, privilege of taking the Lord's Supper this morning, okay? Uh, If you did not get elements on your way in, you can lift your hand right now and the deacons will come around and make sure that you have these. Please hear me. The Lord's Supper is for all born again believers. Those of us that know him as our personal Lord and Savior. This is a very special moment of remembrance that we will have at the end of service. Um, that Christians take incredibly seriously because it is a picture of the broken body and shed blood of the Lord. So again, deacons are coming around. You lift your hand if you got these on your way in. So the entire service, we're gonna be moving towards uh, that moment of taking the Lord's Supper in a worthy manner, amen? You hold your spot in Acts chapter 27. I'm going to read for you what Paul writes in 2 Corinthians 11. Five times I received from the Jews 39 lashes. Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was stoned. Three times I was shipwrecked. A night and a day I have spent in the deep. I've been on frequent journeys in dangers from rivers, dangers from robbers, dangers from my countrymen, dangers from the Gentiles, dangers in the city, dangers in the wilderness, dangers on the sea, dangers amongst false brethren. I have been in labor and hardship through many sleepless nights in hunger and thirst, often without food, in cold and exposure. And apart from such external things, there has been the daily pressure on me of the concerns of all the churches." Paul wrote that prior to going to Jerusalem in Acts chapter 21, right? We've spent the last several weeks walking through what happened to Paul after he went to Jerusalem. So since writing that, he has been beaten. He has been unjustly imprisoned for two years. He has escaped multiple assassination attempts. And now he has made an appeal to Caesar and he will be transported to Rome. In Acts 27, we will now see his journey by ship from Caesarea to Rome. Now, after all he's been through, surely his trip to Rome will be on a luxury liner, a cruise ship, you know, with all-you-can-eat buffet and a really funny comedy act and, and one of those twisty slides into the pool. Seriously, all jokes aside, right? Can't Paul just make it to Rome safely? You and I have a tendency to be so objective focused, right? God, can you just get me there, okay? I would like to accomplish this. This is the mission, to get me to Rome. However, God cares much more about the process, okay? The process of shaping our character and strengthening our our faith. Hebrews 10 36 says, you have need of endurance. Right? The mindset of our culture is that we deserve a pain-free, accomplishment-filled existence. That's what we deserve. And almost universally, we move away from stress and towards comfort and safety, spending so much of our time feeling sorry for ourselves and coping. So let me just speak for myself. I I, I will confess to you. I know that this tendency has crept within me. 
It has made me soft in areas that need strength. So when I read through Paul's account here in the book of Acts, it makes me sit up, stand at attention. How is he so anchored? He endured so much and continued to rejoice. I mean, if we're honest, guys, three shipwrecks, that's enough. That's enough. And yet, we will see, as he's going through his fourth, the way that that God orchestrates circumstances and rises him up so that he will shine forth God's light in an incredible moment of leadership. Because he has anchored faith. An anchored faith that I long for. Will you pray with me? As we jump in, our Heavenly Father, we come to your word. We come to you, God, longing, saying to you, as fearful as it is, God, would you strengthen us? Would you strengthen our faith through trials, through the storms of life, God, to to be grounded and to have perseverance, to have an anchor that holds, that as, as the waves toss, You are stronger. God, grow us in that area. As scary as it is to say that, you are enough. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Luke has joined Paul on the journey from Caesarea now to Rome. You you see that in the we statements. From here on out in the book of Acts, it's it's we. (laughs) So we are given a lot of detail about this portion of Paul's journey. Festus hands Paul over to a centurion named Julius, okay, who is now tasked with getting him to Rome. It was common for some Roman units to have courier or escort duties. Julius has about a dozen soldiers with him, and there are also a number of other convicts that he's transporting to Rome. Now, Paul is treated completely different from the other convicts, okay? They are chained below the deck. But in verses two and three, we actually see the freedom that Paul is given. He's able to move about freely. He's permitted to have two attendants who are his friends and his servants accompany him along the way, Aristarchus and and Luke. So they leave from Caesarea at the end of August, about AD 59, hoping to reach Rome by the end of October. Now at this time of the year, they are unable to sail straight into the open sea, right? That's the quickest route. I learned in math a long time ago, the shortest distance between two points is a straight line. Well, they can't do that because the winds aren't cooperating. So they have to tack along the coast of Asia and we're given a number, verses three through five, give us uh, the, the route there of all the spots that they stop at. Now, they're fighting the winds, and so uh, most of the ship's uh, propelling is done by slaves who are rowing below the deck. Now, it's gonna take a couple weeks for them to go from Caesarea and to tack along. Now, assuredly, Paul has lots of time to begin to converse with Julius, the, uh, the centurion. Undoubtedly, he shares the gospel, as Paul does all the time. But Luke here uses discretion and doesn't include those details. At the end of verse five, they get to Myra, Verse 6 tells us that the centurion there found an Alexandrian ship sailing for Italy, and he put us aboard it. So Julius transfers the soldiers and Paul and the other prisoners aboard now a large Egyptian grain ship. It's approximately 140 feet long and 36 feet wide. It's 
a large, sturdy ship that's able to sail into the open seas. But it has a great weakness. It, it only has one mast, and it is unable to sail into the wind. Okay? Now, we will find out that there are 276 crewmen and passengers on board. So in your mind, think that this ship is filled with merchants from Egypt. It's an Egyptian ship. That's where Alexandria is. And Italy, that's where they're going, along with probably some merchants from, from China and India, women and children, scholars and slaves, priests and entertainers and veterans, all there on the ship together. Now, leaving Myra, they, again, would like to sail straight towards Italy, but verse 7 tells us the details that the wind would not permit. So we sailed under the shelter of Crete. You see how they, they have to drop down below, under the shelter of Crete, off uh, Salmon. And with difficulty sailing past it, we came to a place called Fair Havens. Uh, near which is the Sea of uh, La Silla. The weather up to this point has been anything but cooperative. Fair Havens has no port. If there is a, a port, it's very small and it's too small for this ship. So they anchor in the bay. Uh, and they will be there for several weeks. And only select people will be able to use the dinghy to go on land. This is where Paul will actually get off. He, he is allowed to get off and go tour through Crete and find out the status of the church that's now at Crete. Acts chapter 2 verse 21 says that there were Cretans who were there when the Holy Spirit fell at Pentecost. Okay? And so, presumably, right, they now have the gospel and they have gone back to the island of Crete and planted churches. But in the almost three decades since, as Paul travels around, he finds the church in much disarray. They look just like the culture. It's a big mess to clean up. It's possible that Titus is also here on the ship and just is unnamed by Luke, but it's more probable that once Paul gets to Rome, he sends Titus back to Crete to clean up the mess that he saw when he was anchored there at Fair Havens Bay. This is the letter that we have in the New Testament called Titus. Verse 9 tells us that the fast day, that's the day of atonement, had passed, which means that we are now into October. Navigation is still possible, but it becomes increasingly dangerous. By November, navigation of the open sea was deemed impossible because there was a high probability of be, of it being overcast for days and no opportunity to get your bearings. They, they sailed by bearings. You have to navigate through the stars or land. So with that, the window is now closing. They have been stationed there at Fair Havens, but the, it's decision time. Do they station off Fair Havens and spend the entire winter there on the boat, living off the boat's resources, or do they take the risk of bumping down further, heading west on the island of Crete and, and getting to the port of Phoenix where they could actually winter and they could get off for the entire winter and, and station the boat there. There was a port there in Phoenix. Now, Paul uh, is, has a lot of experience, right? With three shipwrecks, you've got a lot of experience here. In addition to that, with all of Paul's uh, missionary journeys, certainly we would say that, that he's been given a lot of intuition now through the Holy Spirit. And he wants them to stay put, just stay put in Fair Havens. His voice 
as a prisoner is, is shockingly, it carries a lot of weight because the centurion is listening to him and asking him his opinion. The centurion, his rank will give him the final say. In verses 10 and 11, Paul said to them, men, I perceive that the voyage will certainly be with damage and great loss, not only uh, of the cargo and the ship, but also our lives. But the centurion was more persuaded by the pilot and the captain of the ship than by what was being said by Paul. So, they're like, we're going to go for it. Well, right about that time, a, a gentle breeze comes up from the south. And they take this as, okay, this is our opportunity. Let's do it. So they quickly jump and they head out west. But look at verse 11. But before very long, they rush, uh, there rushed down from the land a violent wind called the Uraquillo. And when the ship was caught in it, they could not face the wind, and they gave way to it, and we had to and let ourselves be driven along. So they tried to get to the port of Phoenix, but that wind came rushing through, and now suddenly they are being driven out to sea, losing all sense of where they are. Suddenly they are battered by the wind and soon the ship will begin to take on water. Verse 16 tells us they get, they get slight reprieve with the shelter of a, a small island, uh, uh, Caudia, I think, right there. But it, it, So they, they will quickly make uh, uh, boat repairs, but they can't dock, they can't do anything. And a, and a short time later, they are again driven about back into the open sea, right? Praying the storm will let up. Providence says no. They let down anchors to try and gain some stability, but the ocean is too strong. They are violently tossed, bobbing like a cork. They ride to the top of a mountainous wave only to be plunged down into the depths on the other side. Guys, I get motion sickness and it, it's, my stomach is revolving just telling you about this. Could you imagine how miserable it is? The convicts have now been released from their chains and because every able body is is below deck, taking their turns, working the pumps, trying to get the water out because the ship it has begun to take on water. Verse 18, the next day, as we were being violently storm-tossed, they began to jettison the cargo, right? It's riding too low. They're getting rid of weight. And on the third day, they threw the ship's tackle overboard with their own hands. Since neither sun nor stars appeared for many days... That is, they have no clue where they are, no bearings, as no small storm was assailing us. From then on, all hope of our being saved was gradually abandoned. Right? They're fighting for their lives in a panic with Every ounce of energy and strength they have. But the rain and the wind keeps pounding. The waves keep rolling for two weeks. Right? 14 days. Each person, one by one, comes to the end of themselves. They have nothing left. No strength. The end of their strength, the end of their control, even the end of their will to survive. They quit. All hope of being saved was gradually abandoned. And in the darkest hour, when every other leader had lost hope, one remained. Paul. In God's light, will shine through him in an incredible moment. I know we always want to know what is the purpose of our trials. Right? What is God doing? And we can't always see. In fact, rarely can we actually see. But here we can see. 
okay? God wanted to bring 273 people to their end. As in, to the end of their strength, to, to their most desperate. There are no atheists in foxholes. They wanted to, God wanted to bring all of them to the very moment where they could hear the gospel with the most clarity. And he used a guy who had already been through three shipwrecks. Here's your moment, Paul. Remember all of that stuff? Here it is. So that at that moment, Paul could stand up and could shine a light in the darkness of what anchored faith looks like. Real hope. Eternal life. Because Jesus saves and, Paul sa- and God says, listen to my servant, Paul. Do you see the magnificence of the way that God orchestrates this? In verse 21, when they had gone a long time without food, then Paul stood up in their midst. This, this is the, Paul's a prisoner, guys. You, you, you have a centurions and soldiers and all of this, but all of them have quit. All of them have given up hope. And then Paul stands up in their midst and says, men, you ought to have followed my advice. Now that sounds, I'm gonna gonna leave that alone. My wife is here in this service. I might say it in the next service. You ought to have followed my advice and not set sail from Crete and incurred this damage and loss. Yet now, I urge you, Keep up your courage. Okay, he's giving out of a reservoir. He has courage. Here, keep up your courage, for there will be no loss of life among you, but only of the ship. For this very night, an angel of the God to whom I belong and to whom I serve stood before me, saying, Do not be afraid, Paul. You must stand before Caesar. And behold, God has granted you all of those who are sailing with you. Therefore, keep, uh, uh, keep up your courage, men, for I believe, God, that it will turn out exactly at, as it has been told. But we must run aground on a certain island. So, When we ask the question, how do you have anchored faith in the midst of the storms of life? There are are four attributes that we're going to see right here on what allows Paul in the midst of this crisis to rise up and to stand up. Number one, Paul's faith is anchored in God's ownership. For this very night, an angel of God to whom I belong. You see, the God of this storm and the God of the sea and the God who is above it all, he says, I belong to him. That I am his. Like a child belongs to his father, he says, I am his. A pastor once told a story of uh, his, his two daughters, and, and they were young, and, and the wife had, had said to them, girls, go tell your father that breakfast is ready. Well, uh, father was upstairs, and, and the two ran up the stairs, but the older was, was considerably quicker and faster and gets to the top, and by the time the, uh, the little one gets up there, she's out of breath, and she has been far behind. Now, when she reaches the top, the older sister says to her, I have already told daddy that breakfast is ready, and besides, I got to have all of daddy. Well, the little one took the pronouncement quite hard as tears filled her eyes, but her father knelt down and she laid her head on her father's shoulder as he picked her up. Suddenly a big smile came over her face as she looks at her sister and says, and says, uh, 
you might have all of daddy, but daddy has all of me. You see, Paul knows who has all of him and to whom he belongs. Like a sheep belongs to a shepherd. Did not Jesus say, I am the good shepherd and I know my sheep, and my sheep know me. Like a bride belongs to the bridegroom. The Bible often uses the imagery of the intimacy of the marriage union to describe our union with Christ. Ephesians 5.32, this mystery is great, but I'm speaking with reference to Christ and the church. Number two, Paul's faith is anchored in service to God. For this very night, An angel of God to whom I belong and whom I serve. In other words, Paul is saying, hey, listen, you don't understand. I'm on mission for my God. And nothing can stop that. Not even this storm can stop God's plans and purposes for my life. Ephesians 1, 3 through 14 is this magnificent unfolding in the book of Ephesians how you and I have every spiritual blessing in Christ Jesus. Every spiritual blessing in Christ Jesus. And then he lists six things, okay? And the fourth one in verse 9, I'm paraphrasing here, is the fact that how we have every spiritual blessing is that, that God has revealed his purposes to us. Us. John 15, Jesus says, a servant does not know his master's business. But I no longer call you servants. I call you friends. You see, Christians are playing a different game than everyone else. The world seeks its own comfort, temporary pleasure. And the most the world can hope for is that it can leave a lot of stuff to its children. That's it. But Christians seek the kingdom of God, the unshakable kingdom, and with the assurance that we have that kingdom, and every work that we do for that kingdom bears eternal weight and eternal reward. So Paul says, listen, my faith is anchored. I have a mission from God. Number three, Paul's faith is anchored in God's very presence. For this very night, an angel of God to whom I belong and whom I serve stood before me. You say, pastor, I've never had an angel of God stand before me. Well, in fairness, this is Paul's fourth shipwreck, okay? And you recall at the beginning of this service how I I read that list of infirmities? But you, dear beloved, you have been sealed with the Holy Spirit of God inside of you, marked as his own and his own dear presence to guide you. He has not left you as an orphan. He has given you the helper, to guide you, to convict you of sin, to intercede in prayer for you, to illuminate the word of God and to teach you and to give you a confirmation in your spirit that you are his. God's own dear presence to guide you. And fourthly, Paul's faith is anchored in the promises of God. Verse 25, after telling them the good news, Therefore, keep up your courage, men, for I believe God that it will turn out exactly as I have been told. You see, Paul was bold enough to stand up and to proclaim and to believe the promises of God. Now, I want to point out for us, although it's silly that I have to, okay, that Paul believes the promises of God, but that does not mean that he sits back and does nothing the rest of the time and says, hey, nothing bad can happen to us. 
That's not what happened at all. In fact, it's the exact opposite. Okay? He stops a situation where the sailors are going to uh, lower the dinghy and take off themselves. They're just going to abandon ship. He stops that because he knows that it would uh, assuredly end in everyone else dying. Paul believed in God's promises and he believed that God was leading him in the midst of those promises, moment by moment, by giving him wisdom and leadership and courage in the situation. Okay, see, the promises of God gave Paul hope, and then he actively pursued them, acted in accordance with them. His claim of assurance while acting in faith gives validation. Hey, I think Paul really believes this stuff. And it's showing up in his life. It allowed everyone to not just hear, but to see in motion the good news of Jesus Christ. So what about for us? Beloved, God's word is filled with hundreds of promises for you. Hundreds. Wisdom without reproach. Promises about how God's word will convict you and teach you and guide you in your life. Promises about all that you have in the Holy Spirit. As a comforter, as peace, as guidance to all that the Holy Spirit will do towards you. God's word teaches you how to pray and then it encourages you to pray. And then it promises peace on the other side of you praying. Promises of eternal life and eternal rewards. Promises of God fighting for you. Promises of God's presence with you. Promises, promises, promises all to anchor your faith. You see, Paul's journey of being shipwrecked and tossed in the sea is a perfect metaphor for life. You you see, friend, the problem is not that there are storms in life, for that is the nature of the sea and is the nature of our world. You need something more tangible than a John Lennon song singing, Give Peace a Chance. Right? You need someone. Matthew 14. Jesus tells his disciples to, to get in the boat and to go out on across the Sea of Galilee because, because he is going to spend some time praying. And they get about in the middle and suddenly a, a storm comes upon them. It's violent, it's quick. Violent winds and turbulent waves. Pause the story right there. They are in the storm because they did exactly what Jesus wanted them to do. They are on the brink of death. They are scared. They are at their ropes in. They are at the limit of their... Because they did what Jesus asked them to do. In this life, you will have trouble. But then listen to Matthew. And in the fourth watch of the night, he came to them walking on the sea. And when the disciples saw him walking on the sea, they were terrified. And they said, it is a ghost. And they cried out in fear. But immediately Jesus spoke to them saying, take courage. It is I. Do not be afraid. You see, the problem is not that there are storms in in life. It's that you need someone greater than the storms of life. Someone who can walk on top of them. Is the fact that you and I need anchored faith in Christ Jesus. Amen? So, beloved, turn with me now to the Lord's Supper. And I want you to prepare the bread.
Remember, beloved, that the bread represents his broken body. That he became your sin. That he loved you when you were the most unlovable. While you were an enemy, that is when Christ died for you. While you were dead in your sin, when you had no inkling of turning to him, that is when he died for you. So I'm gonna give you just a few moments. As you hold that little piece of bread, as you contemplate his broken body, confess your sins. Look upon him again, remembering how much he loves you, that he was broken for you. While they were eating, Jesus took some bread and after a blessing, he broke it and he gave it to the disciples and he said, take, eat, this is my body. Now I want you to prepare the cup, hold it, we'll take it together. The cup represents his blood. His blood of the new covenant. That there's a new covenant. That on this side of the cross, through his blood, we've been set free. We know the penalty of sin has been paid. There's a new covenant. The Spirit of God indwells us. We have His promises, His assurance that we can walk in anchored faith because of all that has been accomplished on our behalf. So as you hold that little cup and you think about the blood of the new covenant, beloved, I want you to rejoice. I want you to rejoice with inexpressible joy, okay? Because the covenant is yours. The promises are yours. And when he had taken a cup and given thanks, he gave it to them saying, drink from it, all of you, for this is my blood of the covenant which is poured out for many for this forgiveness of sins. Would you pray with me? Our heavenly Father, King Jesus, Our Lord, our Savior, thank you. Thank you for the new covenant in your blood. Thank you for your promises that is not based upon our worth, but it is solely based upon the finished work that you have accomplished, that you loved us enough to offer us your gracious forgiveness, your new covenant 
solely by the gift of faith in your grace. And we praise you. We praise you. We say thank you. We offer back to you a thankful, willing heart, longing to walk worthy of you, longing to to just be able to express back to you the worship that is due. You are worthy of it all. You are worthy. It is in your name we pray. Amen. Beloved, as the praise team comes and leads us in a final song, this is an opportunity for each of us to respond. Now, I pray in the quietness of your heart, you have been responding all through this sermon, and obviously taking the Lord's Supper gave you an opportunity to respond, but in this moment, we're going to stand and we're going to sing, sing in faith with strength and fervor and gusto because you believe the promises of God. If you're here this morning and you need to pray with someone, if you need to talk to someone about Jesus, you could not take the Lord's Supper with us because you have never come to that moment when you have received Jesus as your Lord and Savior. Today is the day of salvation. Our God is near. He, He brought 273 people to the brink, to the end of their strength so that Paul could stand up and shine the light of Jesus, okay? If that is you this morning, if you came in confused, needing hope, hear me, there is hope in Jesus. Today is the day. Call upon his name. Do not wait. You can do it right there where you are in your seat. By faith, you can cry out and you can say, I am a sinner. I have fallen short of the glory of God, but in the name of Jesus, I I am cleansed. I am forgiven. He has accomplished it all for me. If that is you this morning, we'll have ministers down here at the front who would love to pray with you. I'd love to talk with you. There's a card in the pew rack in front of you. Respond in faith. You hear me? Respond in faith. That's the answer for all of us is to now stand to your feet and respond in faith.